If I, if I put this image on the screen, you guys know what this is? It's a lot of, a lot of people have them on their desks, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of fun to play with uh, from time to time. It's called a pendulum. It's a pen, pendulum or pendulum? That's the, that's the really big question there. Um, how many of you... How many of you had parents that uh, lived through the Great Depression? Show of hands. Uh, grand, grandparents that lived through. Grandma and grandpa were from me here. Um, my, uh, both my parents grew up uh, poor up in Wisconsin. And having gone through a uh, Great Depression and a World War, it just gave them a different outlook on life. All right, so... Um, one of the things that my dad taught me at a very early age was there's a big difference between things that you need and things that you want, all right? And they lived their life just differently than my family and uh, than other people characteristically live their lives today. Uh, they lived at a time when it wasn't a consumer economy. It was an economy of scarcity. Um, the things that they had, they took really good care of, and they held on to everything. So... Uh, My grandfather on my mom's side had this garage on the side of their house, and it was full of just stuff, like all kinds of stuff that they might need some days, like like the Troy Cooper way of life. Doesn't throw anything out at all. We're going to find a place. You never know when we're going to need it, and we don't want to go and have to buy something when we do need something. Uh, it It was kind of the same on my dad's side, too. They just didn't have much at all. They didn't buy anything. So when I grew up in my house, um, we, we were more financially well off than both of my parents were, but you wouldn't know it. Um, they didn't, my dad's biggest motivation was to make sure that the kids and the family had the opportunities that he wasn't afforded when he was our age. And so we didn't just go out and get snacks and buy stuff on a whim and anything like that. It was, there was a lot of no's. Dad, can I have that? No. Mom, can I get that? No. Sorry, I don't have the money for it. And it was just a little bit of a, of a different way of growing up. And so what happened was the pendulum started swinging. All right? So you guys grew up in, in poor families, poor parents, Uh, You grew up with a certain mentality. Now it's a different story. And so the pendulum swings over here. We can be a little bit more free with our possessions, with the things that we purchase until something else comes along and then we've got to tighten back up and the pendulum swings back. This morning, what I want to do is I want to talk about the pendulum swinging in terms of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and really the, the history of the Holy Spirit. Of all theological topics, the one that you would look at and say, wow, the culture is really shifting drastically. And doctrinally, there's a different perspective on this. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit would probably be one of the, uh, the strongest doctrines that has responded to the shifts in the culture. We're gonna continue our sermon series through the Holy Spirit this morning. Last week, I talked about the mystery of the Holy Spirit. This year, or this, this year, this week, what I'd like to talk about is the history, the history of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna talk a lot about uh, people, influences, the Pentecostal movement, uh, Protestant liberalism, just different things like that. So just bear with me as we go. Like I said, this is going to be a little bit different this morning. Uh, let's, talk, let's start with the early church in the patristic era. About 100 AD to 500 AD is the patristic era of the church fathers. And there really wasn't a whole lot that was discussed concerning the Holy Spirit. Augustine was the theologian of the Holy Spirit, wrote a book on love when he considered the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the other persons of the Godhead. Really, the early church was consumed with the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Father and to the Son. It was equally of deity, and it was equally to be worshiped along with the Father and the Son. But the early church's interest in the Holy Spirit was primarily ontological, or it was a concern of his, his being, his essence. The Middle Ages and the Renaissance was kind of the same. We're just fast forwarding, going pretty quick here. Um, There was a a split between the Eastern and Western parts of the church, the Western civilization, Western world, uh, really concerning the sending of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit sent from the Father or is the Holy Spirit sent from the Father and the Son? That's kind of led into a a more modern debate now, postmodern debate about 
subordination in the eternal trinity, if you guys are carrying on, carrying on with any of those conversations. But uh, it was about the sending ministry of the Holy Spirit and how we were to understand it. By the time you get to the modern period, 1750 to 1950, uh, things got to be very, very interesting in the history of the church and what was going on in the world. The modern period began with the dawn of the Enlightenment. It was a watershed moment in Western civilization. And it was called the Enlightenment because it was assumed that the philosophies, the culture, the world at that time had been blinded to or in darkness concerning the things that the Enlightenment stood for. Human reason, science, and rationality. The emphasis of the Enlightenment was on the ability of the human reason alone to penetrate the mysteries of the world. This is where we saw the figures like John Locke, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Voltaire uh, came about, and a lot of deep intellectual, philosophical thinking on a worldwide scale. The major effect on Christianity was extremely significant. Um, people didn't want the faith of Christianity to fail the tests of rationality, of reason, and science. And so in the Enlightenment, they put the faith to the test, to the same critical tests and study that they did every other area of, of thought and belief. Um, what we were left with toward the end of the Enlightenment was a Christianity that had been remade, had been revisited in every way. Um, Richard Niebuhr is a famous voice, and, and he describes what happened to Christianity really well. So at the end of the Enlightenment, Christianity was this. It was a God without wrath, bringing men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. The Enlightenment took away everything out of the faith and out of the scriptures that couldn't be proven scientifically. That didn't make sense to the intellectual elite of the day. They just did away with it. Uh, the miracles of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, the supernatural intending of the, of the scriptures in the word of Christ, and the word of God. Everything was basically uh, revisited and either done away with completely or redefined because of the enlightenment. And after a generation of this, here's what happened. The pendulum swung. In the enlightenment, everybody was concerned about reason, thinking, intellectual aspects of who God is and how deeply they could think through it, out of that, the pendulum swung to the romanticism and the romantic period. Now, the church was concerned with emotions, feelings, and experiences. Reason that was once seen as the great liberator through the history of the world was now seen and increasingly regarded as enslaving, and the romantic movement was birthed. Human intuition, imagination, and feelings were the primary concern. At this time was the beginning of the, uh, the Pietists and the Puritans. And the Pietists and the Puritans emphasized through church history and through their uh, influences upon theology, they emphasized experiences, dramatic experiences and conversion. This is where you read all the stories and the testimonies of the Puritans who came to faith through something drastic and, and colorful in its depiction on type. Um, they preached the Bible. They lived holy lives because of the experiential aspects that they couldn't find in the Enlightenment and with the intellectual community. Just as the Enlightenment was an awakening, now the church had their own awakening. In fact, they had two of them, the first great awakening and the second great awakening. Uh, they were an awakening to the experiential side of the Christian life and to a different aspect of the Christian life. Uh, two great figures of the first great awakening were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. Uh, George Whitfield was said to have uh, preached, he could have convinced anybody to believe in the gospel if you gave him 20 minutes to preach on the gospel. Uh, the guy was one of the itinerant preachers, just going from place to place on horseback, an amazing calendar and the ability of what he could do was, um, it was just shocking in many ways. It started in 1730, mostly in New Jersey, in the area in and around Massachusetts through Jonathan Edwards' ministry. It was an awakening to the gospel over the slumber and the sleepiness, not of the church before, but of the enlightenment of intellectual thought. 
what's interesting about the first great awakening is it's totally different from the second great awakening. Jonathan Edwards saw that the first great awakening was placing a great emphasis and Christianity was placing a great emphasis on emotions, on experiences and on these great grand stories of conversion. And so he actually wrote a book, it was, it's entitled, A Treatise Concerning Religious Affections. And he described what really is true Christianity coming out of this period in the first great awakening. He said, true spirituality will affect the will and the soul, not just the emotions, not just the mind, but how we actually live our life and our desires. Experiences, he said, cannot verify or falsify the validity of a conversion. You can't go to experiences and say, yes, that person's a true believer or no, that person is not a true believer. That's not our responsibility anyway. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. But experiences can be tricky, Jonathan Edwards would say. Thirdly, he listed several factors that were indicative of a true conversion. Again, not knowing fully what only God can know, which is the status of the heart. Edwards saw the appeal to emotions and feelings during this time, and he didn't want theology and scripture to be clouded under the drama of it all. He wanted to preserve the true teaching of the faith, and he was a pioneer in that effort. Uh, the Second Great Awakening couldn't have been more diametrically opposite than the first. If Jonathan Edwards, George Whit Whitfield were the characters of the First Great Awakening, Charles Finney is the character of the Second Great Awakening. And if I ever mention Charles Finney in a sermon or any kind of Bible study class we're doing, usually it will not be in a positive light uh, because of what we know from history. Unlike Edwards, who explained the theology and the biblical exegesis of revival from John chapter 4, from 1 John 4, Finney proposed that revival is mostly an issue of method and technique. It's strategy. If you do this right, and if you say it this way, you can get an emotional response and an experience from a crowd of people. He employed two strategies. One was the anxious bench. If you went to a sermon preached by Charles Finney at that time, he would reserve a front bench in the church. He'd called it the anxious bench. And he said, if any of you are getting anxious as you hear the gospel being preached to you, I want you to come up and sit right in the front and just listen to me a little closer and feel the things that I'm saying to you. And it was a, it was a pressure cooker. He brought up to the front of the church, they heard the gospel, and it was just a, a tactic that was used. The other tactic he used was the protracted meeting. He would create these tent gatherings and try to get as many townspeople as he could clumped all together really tightly, and he would preach and preach and preach and preach until people would respond to the gospel. And so finally somebody's like, okay, I'll respond if this guy will stop preaching, right? He would just keep going until, quote unquote, the Holy Spirit would work through his preaching. His definition of revival was purely philosophical. It had everything to do with practical means of eliciting a response. Whereas Edwards preached a famous sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God and came from a more Calvinistic, reformed perspective, Finney's sermon was sinners bound to change their own hearts. And he was much more Arminian in his perspective. He understood the essence of Christianity as a crisis conversion, individualism, and anti-tradition. He was not appealing to the voices of the past, an orthodox Christian, what we would understand as the right teaching of the faith. He was against all those things toward individualism, experiences, and emotion. Uh, Dr. Bingham, my church history professor, said this, the revivals in the 1800s did much to hamstring the mind. Why? Because it was a response. The pendulum had swung. Well, now it's all the way over here, and we forgot completely about the mind and the intellect. There's a great German theologian by the name of Friedrich Schleiermacher, who was a major part of this emphasis in, ch in church history. He shifted the basis of faith from God's word to human experience. How do you know if you're a Christian? 
because I know I had a personal experience, a feeling and an emotion about it. He instigated what is now known as Protestant liberalism. It was liberal because it was liberating from the trappings of the mind and into a human experience, emotions and feelings. Here's why I'm saying all this. Guess what movement was birthed from Protestant liberalism? Pentecostalism is the next step in the holiness movement into the church. And this is why I want to talk about all of it. History is often marked by threes. If I said Barry, Maurice, and Robin, who am I referring to? John knows the Bee Gees. Staying alive, staying alive. Uh, uh. Man, there's a lot of great threes. There's the, no, don't do that. Three Musketeers, Peter, Paul, and Mary, three Amigos, three Stooges. I'm gonna give you three strands of the modern Pentecostal movement. And here they are. The first strand is this, it's the revivalism of Charles Finney and his appeal to emotions and experiences. Number two is the mother strand of the modern Pentecostal movement, which is the Methodist church, the Methodist movement. Uh, many of you don't realize this. If you're a charismatic or a Pentecostal, you have some background in that. You can trace your, trace your lineage back to the Methodists. It is distinctly Methodist in its theology of sanctification. We'll talk about that. And third, the third strand is the American holiness movement. Uh, you wonder why most Pentecostals and charismatics believe that you can lose your salvation? Because that's a Wesleyan Methodist thought. It comes right out of their doctrine. Uh, John Wesley, the father of uh, not only the Methodist church, but also uh, the modern Pentecostal thought in this. John Wesley was alarmed at how deism was spreading across Europe and Oxford. He saw a, uh, a, a direct assault on the gospel that appealed to some God up there somewhere, but not a personal God that can be known through the person of Jesus Christ. He and a few of his buddies were serious about, his Christian, about their Christian life. They weren't playing around and they didn't want just the intellectual agenda that came out of uh, the modern enlightenment time. Um, all the deists wanted to tell John Wesley, just chill out a little bit. You don't have to be such a holy roller. But he and his buddies formed what was called a holy club. They were known as Bible moths and they were known as Methodists was another term that they used to describe them. And here's why. Met Wesley could not see how you could be a half-hearted Christian, but he also could not see how God was gonna work through the weaknesses in the areas of sin that he had in his own life. And so here's what he did. He cataloged all his weaknesses, all of his spiritual weaknesses. And he came up with a plan to deal with each and every one of them very systematically. It was a method of dealing with his Christian walk. And it was such a strong method that was, that was known at that time, it came to be associated with Methodism, all right? He drew up a plan for living your Christian life. Follow this method, and you can be a wholehearted Christian. In fact, if you follow his method, you will experience two works of grace. There's a first work of grace, which is the work of regeneration. It's new birth. Upon faith in Jesus Christ, you become a believer. But that's not the only work of grace that's needed. A second blessing or a second work of grace is needed, which is entire sanctification. And if you have the first work of grace and the second work of grace, then you can be made perfect as a Christian on this side of glory. But if you've only had the first work of grace, you're not gonna be perfected in your Christian walk. And that's how... Uh, this theology of the first and second blessings or the first and second work of grace was formed. Wesley, Wesley's Methodism appealed to two works of grace and he applied those to the holy life and to holy living. It launched the third strand of the modern Pentecostal movement, which is the National Holiness Movement, also associated with the Keswicks, uh, Christian Missionary Alliance, CMA. Any of you guys? This is rooted in... Uh, the modern holiness movement that we have. And it all started with one guy that we know of. Uh, his name was Benjamin Hardin Irwin. He was from Nebraska and he was a Baptist. He came to the faith and he got a hold of the writings and the teachings of guess who? John Wesley. And he brought them into his Baptist frame of mind. He claimed to have followed Methodism and he reached perfection in his Christian life, which he described at that time 
as experiencing a fire baptism. In fact, he would later form the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. At Tulsa Bible Church, we're just an independent Bible church, but it would be really cool to be call ourselves the Fire Baptized Church Holiness Church. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool phraseology right there, right? Uh, in fact, he would say, Benjamin Irwin would say that there are multiple fire baptisms that a believer can experience. You can have the dynamite baptism, the lidite baptism, and the oxidite baptism. Later on, this gentleman confessed to moral failure in ministry. Uh, the reason we know about Benjamin Irwin is because of one of his followers who goes by the name of Charles Parham. Charles Parham was part of the um, National Holiness Movement. He was an evangelist in 1898 until he arrived in Topeka, Kansas. All right. Uh, started the Bethel Bible Institute there, and he taught his students the sanctification of John Wesley with a little bit of a twist to it. Charles Parham was the first one to say that the second work of grace is this. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You guys want to know where that phraseology came from? It comes from this guy right here in Topeka, Kansas. January 1st, 1901, at 7 p.m., one of his students, Agnes Osmond, spoke in tongues in Topeka, Kansas. And it's the first historical evidence of that happening in a long swath. All through church history, from the time of the Bible being written until Agnes Osmond speaks in tongues, there are four references four historical documented references to speaking in tongues, all right? One of them is associated with the Montanist movement, which is a cult, which means there's three other references to it, and they're very cloudy references. We'll talk more about that. I want to get into it today. Uh, Mr. Parham took his ministry to Houston, created Houston Bible Institute, and one of his listeners was an African-American student named William J. Seymour, He couldn't sit in the classroom because he was African-American, so he listened to all the lectures in the hallway outside of the lecture hall. Uh, He moved to California to an address at 312 Azusa Street in Los Angeles. All right. Preached judgment, fire, and the wrath of God. And here's what happened. On April 18th, 1906, San Francisco experienced one of the deadliest earthquakes in the history of the United States. Uh, This was the earthquake that led to the invention of the Richter scale. Uh, Eventually, they they claimed it was about 7.9. Here comes this guy, starts preaching, William J. Seymour, preaches judgment, fire, wrath of God, all authenticated by an earthquake, a very large and deadly earthquake. That's pretty good for ministry. If, if that happens to you, okay? Uh, he led a revival after that that lasted three and a half years. People getting saved, entirely sanctified, perfected in the Christian walk because they had the evidence of speaking in tongues. Parham himself arrived toward the end of that three and a half year revival and he repudiated what happened there as this, and I quote, extreme fanatic, a case of spiritual power prostituted by holy rollers and hypnotists. In fact, Benjamin Irwin, who first taught William J. Seymour and that association, he arrived at at Azusa Street and the fire baptized churches, and he said there really wasn't dynamite, oxidite baptisms. There really just was one spirit baptism with evidence of speaking in tongues. And so he reframed his theology after he showed up at 312 Azusa Street and saw what was happening there. There's all kinds of splinters, Uh, small groups that form out of this Pentecostal movement, speaking in tongues as their one blessing, as their two blessings, as their three works of grace, three blessings in the Christian walk. Uh, Different sects and different interpretations of that are popping up everywhere. Nothing extremely big. One example is out of Hot Springs, Arkansas. Hot Springs, Arkansas said that there's not three works of grace and three works, uh, three blessings In entire sanctification, there's really only two. Baptism with speaking in tongues. That's where the Assemblies of God denomination forms, right out of Hot Springs, Arkansas, because of their specific interpretation of that. Um, Others disagreed and went in a different direction. I want to show you two, just two two more people, and then we'll look at Philippians, okay? Number one, there's a lady by the name of um, 
Amy Semple McPherson. I, I checked with the McPhersons and they're not related this morning, okay? You guys know this lady? This is, it's a pretty amazing story. Born in Canada, she was raised in the Holiness Church. She married Robert James Semple, who was an Irish missionary. Heard him preaching the gospel, joined up forces with them, and they went off to China on missions work. They both contracted malaria. The guy died. Amy didn't die. She came back. She remarries Harold McPherson. She leaves him to preach the gospel message. Later says, come bring the kids and join me while I'm preaching the gospel on the road. He decides he'll go do it. Once he sees what she's doing and preaching on the road, he decides he wants to be the same kind of preacher and start the same kind of conferences. Uh, eventually, they divorced. He moved back up to Rhode Island and took the kids with him. Uh, she creates a ministry in California, preaches to a tent gathering of 1,000 people, later built a temple for 3,500 people. And here's what Amy Simple McPherson did. She brought entertainment to the church. And it was really entertaining when you went to these services. She was known for riding into a service on a motorcycle, uh, riding into a service on horseback. And there's images, if you go online and see her in these white gowns, um, just, a, just a, an amazing snapshot of what was happening in the church at that time through this, this philosophy. Through her church services, she employed artists, electricians, and carpenters. At one point in time, she rebuilt the stage set for every single sermon that she did when she was preaching the Bible. Um, one service, she came in apparently on ropes, suspended on ropes. The entertainment value was very high. 1932, she married for the third time David Hutton, who was an actor and a musician. She falls, fractures her, fractured her skull, goes to Europe to recuperate. Hutton does his acting music thing, which leads to divorce number three. She got more famous for a while because for a while it was thought that she was kidnapped. For three months, she disappeared. She was gone. Everybody thought that she was kidnapped and she would never return. In she walks from Mexico, apparently, uh, claims that she had amnesia. She finally made her way back to the church. Later on, it was discovered that she made it all up. She wasn't kidnapped. She went off and she had an affair with, guess who? Milton Burl. You guys know who I'm talking, some of you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> Milton Berle. Not exactly a guy who's known for his uh, holiness and upright standards of living uh, that he would take for scripture. Eventually, Amy Semple McPherson died of an overdose, okay? Uh, because of this, the church at large started to question Pentecostalism until a few guys arose in and around the area of Kansas City. One of those goes by the name of Oral Roberts, okay? You guys have probably heard that name pretty well. Part of the Pentecostal Holiness Church, Oral Roberts was invited to, uh, to start a church in Georgia, and it lasted less than a year. They brought Oral Roberts as the pastor there. The church, the Holiness Church, decided that they didn't want somebody who wasn't from Georgia, and so he came back ultimately to Oklahoma. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't continue with Pentecostals. Instead, he des decides he's going to start his own evangelical association. It's called the Oral Roberts Evangelical Association. And here's what he does. He starts sen sending mailings. He starts sending magazines, periodicals. Uh, he created a America's Healing Magazine. He does church emphasis with an revi emphasis on revival and faith healings. And he took to something that was catching the American culture in the hordes. In 1950, I say that there was 8,000 Americans that owned a television, the tube. Remember when it was, go turn the tube on? In 1960, it's something like um, 25 million Americans had a TV. The entertainment, the access to entertainment through the TV at this time was astounding and it was catching fire. Um, he said that a 900-foot Jesus appeared to him in a dream to build the City of Faith Medical and Research Building. Four years later, that was 1977. Four years later, 1981, that tower was built. There was a lot of question marks in his fundraising here. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to, I don't know Oral Roberts, and so I'm not going to question his salvation or his heart on any of these things. I just want to be careful with that. 
in Easter of 1987. He told the Dallas Convention Center that was gathered there to, together for a faith healing and rest, unless he raised enough money by the end of the year, the Lord told him that he was gonna die. In January the next year, he said unless he raised $8 million by March, God was gonna take him home. On his board of regents, there was a man by the name of Harry McNevin. He resigned in 1988, very concerned about the use of funds that was going through the Oral Roberts Evangelical Association. In 1989, the City of Faith Medical Center had to close its doors because it lost so much money. Roberts responded by selling his holiday home in Palm Springs, his holiday home in Beverly Hills, and three Mercedes to try to make up for it. Uh, and the reason why I'm telling you that is, is just not because I don't, I don't, it's not for me to decide if the guy's a true believer or not, okay? Um, but just to have discernment, spiritual discernment in the Christian walk is an extremely important component. Even when the Lord and the Holy Spirit works through our emotions, which he does in our experiences, which he will do that, you can't divorce that from spiritual discernment and the, and the gift of discernment that God gives to us. You guys know a, lot, a, bit, a little bit about a Methodist church downtown called Boston Avenue Methodist Church? Guess where Oral Roberts was a member? In 1968, he and his wife decide that they're gonna join the Methodist church, even after a lot of the success he had as a faith healer in these big conferences. It was because the Methodist church offered more leniency doctrinally for a bigger social engagement with people. The things that Oral Roberts wanted to accomplish, the dreams, the visions that God gave to him were gonna be more widely accepted if his audience was broader and wider in their doctrinal leanings. And so again, it was a leniency of doctrine to which brought Oral Roberts to the Methodist Church. At the end of the 1980s, he discarded his membership there for about a period of 20 or 25 years. I want you to do three things as, you, as we think about this, okay? And this one's gonna be probably not maybe what you expect. Number one, consider the pendulum through history and where we are in the church today. Okay, so one of uh, my great mentors used to always tell me, he said this, think about responding to things in life, don't just react to them. A, react, a reaction is immediate, a response is something that's considered, take some time and have some discernment with them. Uh, those who are coming out of a skid tend to oversteer. Have you heard that before? The Enlightenment, we came out of the skid of the Enlightenment and we went to Romanticism. The pendulum swung probably way too far over to liberal Protestantism in the history of church, which led ultimately to the first great awakening. Jonathan Edwards comes in and says, hey, guys, don't divorce reason and rationality just because you're having these great experiences. Then it flipped back in the second great awakening to the, the movement of Charles Finney and the holiness movement in America. There's always been this pendulum effect of the Holy Spirit working through different various denominations and however the culture was leading you to respond to it. The call here is for discernment. What is discernment? It's a spiritual characteristic of sound judgment for perceiving the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error to identify God's will. Spiritual discernment is the characteristic of sound judgment for perceiving the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error and identifying God's will. Now, here's what I want you to do. Look down at Philippians chapter one, all right? And look at verse 15. Is God below using people with the wrong motivations and intentions in their heart? Nope, he is absolutely not. The Apostle Paul gives us a great thing to think about when it comes to this. Verse 15, Philippians 1:15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then, verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Even if somebody has bad intentions or bad motivations, the Apostle Paul is saying, 
this is something to rejoice about. The gospel is being proclaimed. God is still going to use even people with the wrong intentions and motivations of the heart. He's not beyond that. He's not below that. Uh, Number two, know what you believe and why you believe it. Especially when we're about to embark on this, another seven sessions here on the Holy Spirit and how he works in the life of our church body and the life of us as individuals. We'll talk about the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk through all of those things, right? But we have to ultimately know what we believe and why we believe it about the Christian life. Wesley took a massive non-biblical step when he suggested a second work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. You will read none of that in the text of the New Testament. There is nothing there that says the reason that you're failing in sin is because you haven't had the second work of grace. There's nothing that says you need another work or another blessing from God. You have all the spiritual blessings that are available to you in Christ the second that you believe in him. All that does is create comparisons with other people. Arrogance, pride. Look at me, I'm more spiritual than you. I've had the second blessing. Phil hasn't had the second blessing. Come to my teaching through the men's study that they're doing. Don't come to Phil's teaching. You wanna be blessed by somebody with the second blessing? You gotta come to somebody who's had the second blessing. It is so wrong. And the reason why I get a little upset about this is because I do the cleanup work. And to tell somebody that's just been in the faith movement, I've been, Edwin can tell you exactly what I'm talking about. I've been crushed because everybody's telling me the reason that I'm not healed of cancer, the reason I'm not healed of this sickness because I don't have enough faith or I haven't had the second blessing. And then here we do come along and and tell people, let's look into scripture, I'm so sorry. (laughs) It's not there in scripture. Attaining perfection in your walk with Christ on this side of glory is patently impossible. It is not something that you will ever reach on this side of glory. That's the glory of death. In the blessing of death, God removes all the remaining fleshly issues that are inside of us because of our temporary sinful nature and gives us a perfect holy body to be with him forever. We will be like the resurrected Christ, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, as our bodies are transformed to be likened unto his transformed body in glory. And that is yet something that is, that is future. Um, who is more spiritual than whom? That is not a question that builds healthy Christian communities. We all need Jesus desperately no matter where we are. That's the statement that builds healthy Christian community. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Every one of us is one decision away from a Bathsheba incident, from a a train wreck in our spiritual lives. Um, None of us are above sin. All of us are susceptible to it. We gotta know what you believe and why you believe it about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And and let let me just say this. Be very careful about developing doctrine from the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. Jesus has ascended into heaven 50 days after uh, the resurrection, day of Pentecost. He ascends into heaven. And then the church begins from Acts chapter 2 onward. Acts chapter 2 is the very beginning of the church. And what you're going to see there is the Holy Spirit coming to believers in different ways. In Acts chapter 2, they are mainly gathered together from different tribes, Jewish people. And here's how the Holy Spirit descends. They repent and they are baptized. Peter says, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 8, it's totally different. Acts chapter 8, you're dealing with Samaritans. Faith comes from the laying on of hands of the disciples in that situation. It's faith plus the laying on of hands. Then the Holy Spirit is received. Acts chapter 10, it's different than Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 8. It's Cornelius and the Gentiles who received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was received in Acts chapter 10 by hearing the preached word of God. The Holy Spirit descends. There's no mention of tongues until after at the very end of that passage. Acts 19 is still different than that. 
There's baptism that's mentioned there. It's important to distinguish between baptism of the Spirit and filling of the Spirit. The, the Bible is, is pretty clear when it uses different adjectives and different actions related to the Spirit's work. Baptism of the Spirit is different than filling of the Spirit. There is one baptism, Ephesians 4 tells us. Uh, Romans chapter 6 talks about uh, being baptized in Christ. The second that we place our faith in Christ, we are identified with him through baptism. The, the question you ask when you come to words of baptism in the New, Te- New Testament is not, is this spirit baptism, is it not spirit baptism? It's, is this water baptism or is it spirit baptism, physical water baptism? The second you place your faith in Christ, you are baptized into Christ. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. All the other ones in Acts are descriptive. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is prescriptive of the Holy Spirit and how he works through baptism. All right, we're gonna take the Lord's Supper uh, as well as, as part of understanding, again, what took place the second that we placed our faith in Christ. Guys, there's so much more that I wanna say here. TBC is part of the pendulum, just like all churches, okay? They saw what was happening at the time with the Amy Simple McPhersons, with the Oral Roberts, and the holiness movement that was coming out of the 1950s. And they said, it's time to swing the pendulum this way. We're gonna create a Bible church that's different than what's going on there. So for TBC, here's, here's what I wanna encourage you guys and help you to think about a little bit. Has the pendulum swung too far to the other side? I wouldn't, I wouldn't preach this at another church. I certainly wouldn't preach this in an Assemblies of God church or something like that. Have we swung too far away from the Holy Spirit? Do we need to be a little bit more balanced in that? Again, history informs, nobody does theology in a vacuum. We were a response to something that was happening in the culture. Have we responded too far? I just want you to, to think about that and consider that. Maybe uh, part of where we are as a church might be different than where another church in Tulsa is to where the spiritual aspects need to be nurtured here a little bit more. Just again, something to think about.